And I get to, and, and her, her mom, Susan, is right here. Come here. One of my absolutely best friends. We have been in a prayer group for probably 20 years. Every week, every Thursday. So Susan has prayed for all of you, actually. And it's been such a privilege to, to be able to hear from Sarah. And I'm just thrilled that, that she's here and is being used by God the way she is. So I wanted to read you her bio. I can get you to get a chance to see it. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist living and working in Santa Barbara. She received her MS in marriage and family therapy from Fuller Theological Seminary and has worked in various settings in Santa Barbara, including the Santa Barbara Rescue Mission, Domestic Violence Solutions, and the Community Division of the District. Sarah currently works in the Arkansas Public Center as a mom of two boys, Charlie and Max, ages six and four, and has been married to her beloved Scott for 10 years. So we are so, so glad to have you here. She's going to be talking about vulnerability. And um, there is some scripture at the end that she's going to be talking about, so I, I, I need to be careful. I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> so uh, it'll all be careful. Anyway, we're so, so happy that you're going to be here, that you are here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, can you guys hear me OK? Am I just sort of let me know if I need to speak more loudly. Um, well, I am excited to be here. So excited to be here. Louder, louder, OK. Um, and like Renee said, she has known me since I was six or seven and has said many prayers for me alongside my mom. And I have benefited more than I think I can even realize. So I am so thankful. It's so fun to get to be here. Um, Let's see. Um, I, you know, I also know others of you. I've chatted with some of you this morning, and it's fun just to see familiar faces. And for those of you who don't know me, like Renee said, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist practicing in Santa Barbara. Um, <clears throat> and you know, this morning, I mean, just to say, I'm excited to share from my sort of professional experience and training and the work that I do, but I'm also really excited just to share some of my own journey and process and from what I've been challenged to learn um, personally, especially in my own journey as a mom. So I'm going to speak from that place too. Um, so let's see. Um, it's funny because my title is Embracing Vulnerability and Getting Closer in Relationships. And I just want to name, we're, we feel vulnerable in different ways. And you guys were asked to sort of tell a story, an embarrassing story from recently, from the past week or so. And that can feel vulnerable to talk about these moments when we feel embarrassed. And standing up here in front of you can feel vulnerable, right? But I figured if this is the title of my talk, then I just have to embrace it. And, and, and you know, here I am. So, um, well, let's see. Um, you know, to say again, so, my title here is Embracing Vulnerability and Getting Closer in Relationships. And the sort of starting point for this whole thing is that I believe God has created us to be in relationship, to be in relationship with him, to be in relationship with each other, to be in relationship with our kids, that that's how we were designed. Um, and ultimately, you know, we, I think we all long for that. We all want that. But the, it can be hard to know sometimes what gets in the way and why it can be difficult to um, get closer in relationships. And um, you know, it can be hard to see and understand these things that get in the way. And so this morning, I'm going to talk about sort of what at times can get in the way of our relationships, can get in the way of having closeness, and what we can do to actually grow closer. So how can we um, you know, sort of be able to uh, work through these obstacles that can get in the way sometimes? Um, so I, I've spoken with a few of you. Have you guys heard of Brene Brown? If you just sort of raise your hand, if it's a familiar person. So I'm going to lean heavily on the research that she's done as I talk this morning. Um, we're going to watch a little clip from her in a couple of minutes. Louder, louder, OK. <laughs> we're going to watch a little clip from her in a couple of minutes. And I am going to share a lot from her research. Um, and so I just want to say, you know, her, her research, and she's a, she's a researcher um, and an author. She's written a handful of books. Maybe some of you have come across her books at different times. She's done a few TED Talks as well. Um, and so those have, she's become sort of well-known, more well-known through that. Um, and she's, the research that she's, she's done has centered on vulnerability, um, on shame, on courage, and worthiness. And so those are a lot of the things that, that I'm going to talk about this morning. And just to say, these, this work has been helpful 
helpful in my, my own work with clients in the sort of professional part of my life, but also very much in my own process. So I'm going to speak from that too. Um, okay, so where to start? Um, Maybe some of you can identify this with this. Once I became a mom, I began a very refining journey. <laughs> the most refining journey, I think, that I've ever had in my life. Um, and I have been forced to look at my own self and my own stuff in a completely new way. Um, I imagine some of you can relate to that. So I'm going to start by telling you a story. It's an embarrassing story. Um, so this is my answer to our starting question. Um, although this happened a while ago for me. This was probably two years ago. And I have, like Renee said, I have two boys. They're now six and a half and four. So this was probably two years ago, and my oldest son was about four. And we were doing swim lessons. And, you know, we're all excited to go to swim lessons. This is the first time he's done this. And I've, I'm, we're in a setting where there's a pool in the, someone's backyard. And there are a couple other kids in the pool and other families around the outside of the pool. And my objective, my task at hand, is to get my four-year-old ready and in the pool, right? So I'm like, okay, buddy, here we go. And it's going to be so fun and da, da, da. And you're going to learn how to swim, blah, blah, blah. And he's having none of it. I mean, does not want to have anything to do with swim lessons, does not want to get in the pool. He starts yelling. He starts screaming. He starts throwing his shoes. I mean, literally, he's taking his shoes off and he's throwing them. And before I know it, he has run away from me, out the back of the house, out the gate, down the driveway, down the sidewalk. Like, he's just, he's done. Just gone. And I am so embarrassed, right? Like, I feel mortified in this moment. And like we said, you know, the stories that I asked you guys to, to think about and to share at your tables, there are these moments that we have that are just embarrassing. And that's a part of life. Um, but I want to share, in that moment, I want to share with you some of the thoughts that were going on in my head. And this is what we're going to talk a little bit more about today. So here are some of the thoughts. <clears throat> what are all these other parents thinking about me, right? Um, they must think that I'm a terrible mom. Oh my goodness. You know, I should be able to manage my kid better. Um, my friend's kids wouldn't do this. This is a big one for me. I usually come up with the so-and-so in my head, and I'm like, so-and-so sweet little girl would never do this, right? Um, things like, I don't set enough limits for my kid. Somehow, this must be me. This must be something wrong that I'm doing. I'm just, I, I'm not doing it well enough. I'm just not a good enough mom. So do you see how I went from an embarrassing moment to kind of walking through these pretty negative thoughts in my own mind and these negative beliefs about myself? And I got to this place. So I share this story because this is a window into my own experience of shame and what shame can look like for me. Um, you know, shame, again, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of what exactly shame is, um, but just to think about you know, the areas where we feel a particular inadequacy in our lives. So this is an example of a moment where I experienced that. Um, some of you might be able to relate to this. This may have happened to someone else in this room, something similar. Um, if not this, you know, maybe something else. Um, your thoughts might not look exactly like my thoughts. They might take a slightly different form. But the reality is we all experience shame. We all experience this in some form or another. It's a universal thing. So we're going to go ahead and watch a video here. Um, some of you may have seen parts of this. Uh-oh. Hoping it comes up. Um, this is from Brene's talk, Brene Brown again. She has given a couple of TED Talks. Uh oh. <laughs> there we go. And I'm just going to show a little clip from one of her talks. It's called The Power of Vulnerability. And some of you may have seen this. Um, okay. Give me just a moment here. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today, and we're talking about expanding perception, and so I want to talk to you and tell some stories about a piece of my research that fundamentally expanded my perception um, and really actually changed the way that I live and love and work and parent. Um, and this is where my story starts. When I was a young researcher, a doctoral student, my first year I had a research professor who said to us, here's the thing, if you cannot measure it, it does not exist. Really? And he's like, absolutely. So you have to understand that I have 
a bachelor's in social work, a master's in social work, and I was getting my PhD in social work. That's so my entire that? academic career was surrounded by people who kind of believed in the life's messy, love it, you know, and I'm more of the life's messy, clean it up, <laughs> organize it, and put it into a bento box. Um, and so to think that I had found my way, to found a career that takes me, you know, really one of the big sayings, in, in social work is lean into the discomfort of the work. And I'm like, you know, knock discomfort upside the head and move it over and get all A's. That's my, that was my mantra. So I was very excited about this. And so I thought, you know what? This is the career for me. Because I am interested in some messy topics, but I want to be able to make them not messy. I want to understand them. I want to hack into these things that I know are important and lay the code out for everyone to see. So where I started was with connection, because by the time you're a social worker for 10 years, what you realize is that connection is why we're here. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. This is, this is what it's all about. It doesn't matter whether you talk to people who work in social justice and mental health and abuse and neglect. What we know is that connection, the ability to feel connected, is neurobiologically, that's how we're wired, it's why we're here. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna start with connection. Well, you know that, that situation where you get an evaluation from your boss and she tells you 37 things that you do really awesome and one thing that you kind of have an opportunity for growth? <laughs> um, and all you can think about is that opportunity for growth, right? Well, apparently this is the way my work went as well because when you ask people about love, they tell you about heartbreak. When you ask people about belonging, they'll tell you the most excruciating experiences of being excluded. And when you ask people about connection, the stories they told me were about disconnection. So very quickly, really about six weeks into this research, I ran into this unnamed thing that absolutely unraveled connection in a way that I didn't understand or had never seen. And so I pulled back out of the research and thought, I need to figure out what this is. And it turned out to be shame. And shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me that if other people know it or see it, that I won't be worthy of connection? The things I can tell you about it, it's universal. We all have it. The only people who don't experience shame have no capacity for human empathy or connection. No one wants to talk about it, and the less you talk about it, the more you have it. What underpinned this shame, this I'm not good enough, which we all know that feeling, I'm not blank enough, I'm not thin enough, rich enough, beautiful enough, smart enough, promoted enough. Um, the thing that underpinned this was excruciating vulnerability. This idea of in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen, really seen. And you know how I feel about vulnerability. I hate vulnerability. And so I thought, this is my chance to beat it back with my measuring stick. I'm going in. I'm going to figure this stuff out. I'm going to spend a year. I'm going to totally deconstruct shame. I'm going to understand how vulnerability works. And I'm going to outsmart it. So I was ready. And I was really excited. As you know, it's not going to turn out well. Um, <laughs> All right, I'm going to leave you all in suspense on that. You can go um, watch the rest of her talk. Just Google it and it'll come up. Um, so I love how she presents what she has researched because it's just, I think, so easily accessible and easy to understand. Um, so she says, right, that she had sort of this objective to go and beat back vulnerability and master it. Um, and it's obviously not going to work out well. So what she goes on to talk about is that while she wanted to outsmart vulnerability, um, that she discovered that in fact, she needed to lean into it, that she needed to embrace it, that there was absolutely no way around it. She couldn't actually master it, right? That there was no way around it, um, that if you're wanting to find true connection and intimacy in relationships, that you just have to embrace vulnerability. Um, so, uh, we'll get to that a little bit more. First, I want to go back and talk about shame a little bit. Um, 
she talked about this unnamed thing, this thing that unraveled connection and closeness in relationships. And she goes on and defines this, discovered in her research as she was interviewing many, many people. She came to define this experience that people were talking about as shame. Um, and the definition of shame, as she said in the video, is this, it's the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me? <laughs> An escape artist. Escape artist. <laughs> I feel shame. No, don't feel shame. Don't feel shame. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great. See, we just get to be in this journey together, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that's right. I love it. Keep updating them every day. That's right. We have new, a new supply every day. Totally. Um, okay, so the definition of shame, and this is on the handout. There's a handout at the tables. I put it there at the top. Definition of shame is the fear of disconnection. So is there something about me? Is there this, other, this thing that if other people know it or see it will somehow mean that I'm not worthy of love or connection? Um, and you know, again, like I said at the beginning, it, it takes different forms for each of us, but I believe we all experience this in one way or another. Shame is that voice that says to us, I'm not enough. She, Brene referenced this in her talk. So I'm not, like, like I shared with you, I'm not a good enough mom. That can be a little voice that I hear from time to time. I'm not good enough at my job, you know? I'm not a good enough friend, and whether that means I'm not social enough or sensitive enough or, you know, we have these different things, these different fears that we have in our heads and these different messages. Um, the other thing that shame does is it tells us that we're alone. This is the, the unraveling part, the disconnecting part of shame. Instead of this moment where I have this little voice and then I think, oh, you know, I bet so-and-so also feels that way. Instead, we start to believe, oh, it's just me. I'm the only one who has this particular struggle. Um, so it tells us it's alone, that we're alone. In this way, it's disconnecting. Again, that, that idea that so-and-so, you know, my friend, you know, Julie, doesn't experience this. She isn't, she would never, this would never happen to her. Those sorts of thoughts and messages. And we can get lost in that, thinking that it's just us. Um, and this is one of the things that gets in the way of relationships. We talked about how we all actually long for connection and closeness, and there are these things that get in the way. And I think this particular message of shame is one of those things. Um, I just want to say quickly that you know there can be a question around shame and guilt, and what's the difference? And sometimes that can be confusing. Um, so just to mention it. Um, guilt is the experience that we have, the emotional response that we have when we feel like we've done something wrong. And in that way, guilt is actually motivating. It propels us to try to seek forgiveness or to, to change something. You know, it's that idea of, I said this thing and it was insensitive and it hurt her feelings. And now I'm gonna go and I'm going to say, I'm so sorry. I apologize for that. So guilt is motivating, it's productive, it moves us forward. Shame, on the other hand, is this idea that not just that I've done something wrong, but that I, I am wrong that there's a particular part of me that's not the way that it's supposed to be. Um, and in that way, it's really paralyzing. It causes us to feel really stuck. We can't see, it's, it, it's confusing, we can't see our way out sometimes, and we can feel really lost in it and alone. Um, and in that way, again, it's, it's one of those things that it, it really keeps us from reaching out and connecting with one another. Um, so all to say, shame feels really big and scary. You know, it's a big, dark, ugly feeling that we can feel. And we don't want to have to feel it. Um, and so because we don't want to have to feel it, there are a handful of things that we do to try and numb, defend, protect ourselves against this feeling of shame. And I'm going to go through those. They're on the handout there. Um, the first numbers, one through four. These are just common things. And again, this is actually from um, a lot of the research that Brene Brown has done in her endless interviews with people. So this is research-based. Um, <clears throat> these are just things that we do when we start to feel shame and we want to not feel it. We want to protect and defend ourselves against that feeling. So the first one we do is we control. Um, I totally do this. This is one of the things that really resonates for me. I don't know if anybody else, you know, I'll, I'll share more about it and you'll see if you connect with this too. Um, so I have a story to tell. I had a, a I'm a practicing therapist and I, was, I had a, 
a particular day at work that was overwhelming. I mean, it was just a hard day for a few different reasons. And at the end of the day, I was overwhelmed. I was feeling inadequate, certainly, in some of my skill and what I was able to do. And, um, and I started having thoughts, you know, kind of like, I can't do this job. Why did I think that I would be able to do this job? Why did I, you know, why did I sign up <laughs> for this kind of thing? And, but just feeling the inadequacy in it. And um, so I'm having those thoughts and I'm driving home and I come home and I walk in the door and my husband Scott is making dinner. Wonderful gift, right? He's making dinner. And, um, and I immediately come in and I start to notice and I'm sort of, I start realizing I have these thoughts like, he's, he's making pasta. And I thought, oh, he's, he used the big pot, you know. Why do he use the big pot? Now we have to clean the big pot. And, those tomatoes, he needs to put those tomatoes in the sauce, they need to start simmering, you know, and I, I, well, I didn't say it exactly like that to him, I came in and I think I said something like, you know, why did you use the big pot and don't you think those tomatoes should go in? I just came in and I took over, right? I controlled because I know how to make that pasta dish, like, it's no problem. And so I came in, and in order to cover up my feeling of uncertainty, I came in and I started doing actions of certainty. So that's just a, a little window into a way that we we use control. We use control to take away some of that uncertainty and that discomfort and sometimes those feelings of shame that we can have. Um, the second one on the list is we blame. And this is a big one. <laughs> I also do this. I think I do all of these. But um, this one is just, it's, it's so easy to do. It's so easy to do this. So the idea here is that when we feel something that's really uncomfortable, and especially when we feel, start to feel those really deep sort of feelings of, of shame or inadequacy, insecurity, and those areas that we just know we feel insecure in, we don't want to feel it. It feels really uncomfortable. And so what we do is we sort of discharge the discomfort. It's, it's a basic sort of like um, psychological idea, this idea of projection, that we're going to project it onto somebody else, and now I can point to this thing in that other person, and I get to blame them for it. And now I don't have to feel it anymore. I can put it on them, and now it's become about them. So I'll tell you a little story about this one, <laughs> too, from my own life. Um, I have a messy car. I imagine maybe I'm not the only one in the room, hopefully, that this is true for. I think there's a part of this is life with little kids. Um, my car's really messy. It's really messy a lot of the time. And there was a week where it was particularly messy. <laughs> my mom is laughing over here. She has seen my car. Um, <laughs> like, I honestly think, I'm not exaggerating, I think there was a bagel and cream cheese stuck somewhere, like on a car seat or somewhere. I mean, it was just gross. And I, all week long, was like, oh, Sarah, your car is so gross. Like, this is so disgusting. Why did you let your car get so disgusting? You need to go to the car wash or you need to clean out the car, you know, but I never stopped and made time to do it. So all week long, I kind of had these little thoughts floating around in my head. And then come Saturday, we get in the car, my husband, I mean, the boys, and Scott, my husband, turns to me and he goes, this car's really gross, <laughs> right? Which he's just sort of naming this, like, here's our car, it's his car too, and he's like, oh, this car's really gross. Mm -hmm. And I quickly, so quickly, I say, it's been a really long week, don't you be criticizing me for that. So now, my feeling of discomfort in that moment, because he said something, it pushed my shame button, right? And now that moment of discomfort that I felt, I, I put it onto him. Now it's about him being too critical. So now I just get to be angry at him for being too critical, and I don't have to feel this feeling of shame. Um, so again, I think we can do this in, in different ways. We can do this with our kids, too. You know, I think we can do, I'm, I'm sharing some examples with my husband, but there are lots of ways that we can do these things with our children as well. Um, the next one is we perfect. So perfectionism, you know, I think that's a word that gets thrown around. Um, the, again, the idea is that we kind of embrace this belief that if we somehow do enough, if we accomplish enough, if we reach certain, you know, levels in what we, what we do and what we set to accomplish in our lives, that then somehow that means that we're enough. Um, this idea that we can prove our worthiness by the things that we do or the roles that we play. Um, you know, I wanted to say here, I think a little, a little note, with social media, I, I just think there, this is like at a whole new level than I think we've ever known before. I mean, you know, I'm, my life is immersed in social media. I imagine it is for many of you too. It's so easy to feel this, right? To have this like 
perfect picture of someone's or someone's family doing something, and we, we have this now, this benchmark, this thing where it's like, ooh, I'm supposed to measure up to that. So this is this idea, this idea that how we measure up, um, how, how well we look, how well our family behaves, <laughs> you know, how well I perform at something, somehow that, that measures my, my worthiness. And, and we do this because it's a way to kind of try to escape shame, actually. I just, if I work harder at this, then I will feel better about myself. Um, and lastly, we pretend. So um, I would just like to think about this one as this is our mask. This is when we put a mask on, when we have this idea that, you know, I, if I feel inadequate in and of myself, then I'm going to pretend to be someone or something different that somehow feels adequate or feels worthy. Um, and again, this is just a way that we try to pretend and try to escape those feelings of shame. So these are natural tendencies that we have. I think, again, we can all relate to this in some way or another. Maybe some of those resonate more than others. Um, they're natural things that we do, you know, but the sad thing is that when we try to protect ourselves in these ways, it actually yeah. serves to disconnect us. It actually causes distance in the relationships that we have, and it actually causes us to not get the thing that we really want, which is closeness, and, and love and belonging for who we really are. And it gets in the way, gets in the way of our relationships. Um, so if what we really want is love and connection and closeness, then we can ask, what instead can we do when we experience this feeling, when we start to get that shame trigger or that feeling of inadequacy come up, what else can we do um, that can actually bring us closer in relationships instead of causing distance? So again, back to Brene Brown's research. Um, this again is some of what she's come up with that she saw where people had closeness and connection and deep connection relationships and she was able to identify some of the practices, the things that they did. And so this is coming from her research. So these are also on your page um, to the bottom. So basically what we need to do is we need to choose vulnerability. <laughs> and that's easier said than done, right? But um, here are some, I'm just going to go through four sort of practical ways that we can practice this. Um, so again, the idea is instead of using sort of defense and protection against these feelings, that we lean in and we embrace the vulnerability in it. So number one, we take, take risks and embrace the unknown. Um, so this is in direct contrast to that controlling, right? So we embrace the unknown. Um, so in relationships, this means being willing to stick our neck out to initiate the conversation, to invest in a relationship, even if we don't know where it's going, even, even if we don't know what's going to happen. Um, I get a, a, a question that can come up with this sometimes has to do with the relationship between trust and vulnerability. Like it feels a lot easier to be vulnerable with somebody when we trust them, right? Like we sometimes say, well, I don't really, I don't feel safe, so I'm not going to share this or, you know, or, so if I'm going to be vulnerable, does that just mean I tell everybody, the whole world, all my things all the time, you know, and it can be kind of confusing to figure out. And there's this really unique relationship between trust and vulnerability. And basically, what we get to practice is taking a small step of vulnerability, seeing what happens. And that's how we actually end up building trust. So while it feels like we need trust in order to be vulnerable, we actually need vulnerability in order to build trust. So we take little steps and we see what happens. We see how the other person responds. And then we say, okay, that felt, that felt good, that felt safe, I'll take another step. And this is how we build trust in relationships. Um, number two, we let ourselves be seen, really seen, and to be real in what we are feeling. So this just means, on one level, sharing the embarrassing stories, like you guys did at your tables. You know, being willing to say, oh my word, let me tell you what happened to me. You know, and just let it out. Um, you know, it also means being willing to say, this is something I'm really struggling with. You know, will you talk with me about it? Will you pray with me about it? Um, it means telling a story, perhaps, you know, of the past week or something in our past that was significant and letting somebody in to that particular part of our lives. Um, it also means, and this is where I say, be real in what we are feeling. Being vulnerable in relationships also means being willing to do this sort of broad range of emotions, this broad range of feelings with someone. So it means if I feel hurt, I'm going to say something like, 
you know what, I felt hurt when you said such and such. Or if something, if I feel anger about something, being willing to, to express that anger in a way that's you know, appropriate and respectful, but that you're willing to go into those emotions that sometimes are really difficult to go into and sometimes we really like to cover over. Um, so this is part of being real and being seen. Um, <clears throat> third is practice gratitude and joy. And this one is, I think, such an important one. Again, you know, social media and our culture at large, I mean, we're, we live in such a culture of scarcity, this idea that we're, we're not enough, that we don't have enough, that we always need to get more, that there's always more to get, there's always more to do, there's always more to accomplish, right? And, <clears throat> you know, it's so easy. It's so easy to just get lost in that and to do the comparison game. I know I do this all the time. It's so easy. Um, and instead, practicing gratitude and joy is basically choosing to say in response to this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to acknowledge the truth that God calls me enough and that God is enough. And acknowledge the truth that God has an abundance, right? That we have an abundance in him um, and embracing that. Um, you know, building, being willing to kind of open ourselves up to that. And um, there's an interesting thing, this can feel really vulnerable when we acknowledge how good things really are because then we start waiting for the next, you know, the other shoe to drop. And that's sort of this defensive protective thing that we do. Like if I'm always on, on guard, I won't be caught off guard, right? And so it feels vulnerable to just be embracing the goodness that's in front of us, but it's actually part of how we build this resilience and we um, combat shame in that way. And then lastly there, embrace the identity that God gives us. Believe we are worthy of love and belonging just as we are, without performance, without pretending. Um, I think what's tricky about this one is that it is actually a choice. You know, it doesn't necessarily feel easy or come easily. Sometimes we have to choose to believe it. But it is one of those things where it builds on itself. So the more we believe it, the more we will feel it and experience it with others, which will help us believe it more, which will help us feel and experience it more with others. So there's this, you know, sort of continuing cycle there. Um, and again, you know, without performance and without pretending, that means creating a climate of grace for ourselves, for our relationships, for our kids, our families. Um, and the way that we can do this is by starting to have self-compassion. So, you know, the idea is basically saying and telling ourselves it's okay to mess up. It's okay to not know how to do this. It's okay that my four-year-old is running, screaming, crying away from the swimming pool in front of all these other parents who clearly have it all together, you know? And it's okay, it's okay. It's okay for me to not know what to do in this moment. It's okay to muddle through. Um, you know, I was laughing today. I'm, here I am, right? And it's like, for me, in this given moment, I could say something like, you know, even if I'm standing up here and I'm babbling on and nobody's connecting with anything I'm saying or I lose my train of thought or whatever it is, even in the midst of that, for me to feel like, it's okay, Sarah, it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. Um, that I can still hold on to the belief that I am worthy of love and belonging because he has called me so. Um, and so in simple terms, this is basically the idea of letting go of what other people think and embracing this truth that we are enough in him. Um, okay. So I've gone through that. Um, I think what I want to do now just sort of to wrap up is take you through on the back side is take you through a specific example. I think it's kind of one thing to think about all these ideas as concepts and big picture ideas, but it's another to try and really walk it through and figure out what does this actually mean in a given situation. Um, and so I'm going to go through, I'm going to use my messy car example where my bagel was stuck to the wherever it was, you know, my car was a disaster. And that moment when I blamed my husband because I was feeling shame. So I'm going to use that as my own example. As I go through this, if you can, I mean, just, it might be difficult to come up with a time. It might be easy to come up with a time. But if you can dr kind of remember or think about a time when you may have experienced something similar, some of you know, what I've described as this feeling of inadequacy or shame and, and just to kind of try and think about that as I go through this example. So, um, and, and again, what I'm doing here is I'm taking a specific example to try and give us really practical tools of how to do this in the moment. And what I'm sort of leaning on as I do this is um, a general concept of building mindfulness. So the idea there is that it's again, sort of a therapeutic 
thought concept that we're just becoming more mindful of our own thoughts in the moment and our own body physical response in the moment. And those are ways that we can just gain awareness about what's going on for us. Um, and then also the, the cognitive piece. So again, the thought piece to become more aware of what are the thoughts? What are the thoughts that I'm having in this moment? And how are those thoughts impacting my feelings and also my behaviors? So um, number one, gain awareness. So questions in the first moment when you maybe start to think, okay, there's something going on for me right now. There's something that I'm experiencing. I think I might be experiencing shame. And you can ask questions like, what's happening for me right now? What happened leading up to this? What am I feeling and how's my body responding? Um, so for me, in this example with the car, I was feeling frustrated. I've been frustrated all week with myself. I was already feeling sort of shaming, shaming myself in it. Um, Sarah, why, you know, why did you let it get so gross? You know, why aren't you managing your time better? You never manage your time well enough to be able to do these things, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so I'd already been walking myself through this path very well all week long. And, and then in that moment, my body felt tense. As soon as Scott said what he said, my body felt tense, my chest felt tight, and I was ready for a fight. And for me, I know that's what I experience when I feel shame. So I feel like I want to fight. Some people feel like they want to run away. Some people feel frozen. Like just, it's like someone took your brain out and put it over here. You just kind of feel frozen in, in that moment. So we all have different kinds of responses. For me, I'm ready for a fight. So you can think about what, what, what kind of thing, what kind of reaction do I have in that moment? Number two, explore your negative messages and beliefs. Um, so again, this is, this is this, this thought awareness. What are the thoughts behind my feelings? What beliefs about myself am I having? So like I shared, I believed things or was having the thoughts like, I'm too chaotic, you know, my, I'm too messy. Um, So-and-so's car never looks like this or whatever it is, right? But I kind of had these, these thoughts and beliefs that I was having about myself. Um, and ultimately, I think for me, I get to this place where I can think I'm just not, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough in this particular area. I think this is a common um, thought that we can have. Um, so just going through and trying to figure out what are those thoughts for you? What are those, those particular messages that feel most vulnerable and most um, just that you have most often in this area? Three, practice self-compassion. So the idea here is that when we feel shame, we want to hide it. We want to pretend like it's not there. We want to disconnect. We want to push, push people away. And we first need to respond to ourselves with compassion. It's almost like it's this part of ourselves that's going to say, you know what, it's okay, tell me about it. And so we practice self-compassion. So we ask questions like, where do I feel vulnerable? I wanna know more about, what, what am I feeling vulnerable about? What am I feeling afraid of? What's scaring me right now? So in this moment, with, I, had this, I was afraid that I was gonna be judged for this. Um, you know, I was trying to hide that there's this part of me that can be kind of messy and chaotic and out of sorts sometimes. Um, you know, I think we can often be afraid that somebody's going to push us away if they see this part of us. And um, so just to acknowledge that. And then what we do is we want to replace it with a message of grace. So again, there's this like self-compassion where it's like, okay, tell me about it. I want to I know more about what's going on for you. And then replace it with a message of grace. So instead of this fear that somebody's going to push me away or I'm not, I'm not worthy enough, valuable enough because of this thing, we respond with a message like, it's okay to make mistakes. Right? I'm still valuable and worthy. Sarah, it's okay, you've had a crazy week. You know, of course the car's a mess. It's okay, these things happen. Um, and then, you know, the thing that I like is that in, when, once we do that, then we can actually move into growth and change. So the idea here, and I, I like to use this phrase a lot. I say, it's, it's your growing edge, Sarah. <laughs> you know, how do you want to grow in this? Which is motivating. Right now I'm able to take action. Instead of feeling stuck and paralyzed in it and frozen by it, I now want to move toward change. What can you do about this? Maybe every other Thursday you want to clean out your car. You know, coming up with some practical solution where I feel empowered and able to make a change in my life. And lastly, we want to respond with vulnerability. Um, and this just comes back to, again, our goal and this thing that we long for is close relationship. And so when I have this experience of this thing that I want to pretend isn't there, that I want to hide, I'm feeling shame around it. Instead of pushing somebody away and protecting myself against it, I want to actually open it up and say, okay, I want to invite you in 
and tell you that I'm feeling this way. Because I think once I do that, I think we're going to get closer. And so you can ask ourselves, how can I talk about this in a way that actually invites the other person in, um, that allows the other person to get closer to me? A phrase that I think is really helpful that I try to practice is saying something like, the story that I'm making up in my head is that. So if this, with this example with my husband, Scott, instead of saying, don't you be criticizing me for that, to just be able to say something like, oh my goodness, I feel like I'm experiencing some shame, like I'm feeling really embarrassed by this and I'm feeling shame. And the story that I'm making up in my head right now is that you're judging me for this and that you don't like this part of me and you're kind of, you're frustrating, you're pushing me away. And what that does is instead of actually me pushing him away, is it opens me up so that he gets to respond to that. And that's risky. We don't know how the other person's going to respond. You know, but with those people who we know and love and are in our lives, right? it's this invitation where they now get to enter in in a way that they weren't able to do before. And in that moment, I eventually was able to get there with Scott and say something like that, you know, follow, down the road, following up. And of course, he said, I wasn't thinking any of those things. I was just thinking we could go to the car wash, right? <laughs> Imagine that, right? <laughs> so. Um, I, I hope that that is helpful to kind of go through a specific example and give some sort of practical steps of how to walk this through. Um, you know, my conclusion is that it, this all takes courage. It takes tremendous courage, and there is certainly risk involved. But the benefit is that we get to build closeness and, and intimacy in our relationships. We don't have to feel like we have to hide something. We don't have to feel like we're not measuring up. Um, and I, you know, I just want to say too, I think what's amazing in this, I think, is that God empowers us to do this. You know, here's Brene Brown, she's a researcher, she's an author. Um, I have, I've learned she is a Christian, but her research is not faith-based, you know, um, and it's just research. She interviewed people from all different faith backgrounds or no faith, and this is, this is the stuff she came up with. But what's amazing to me, and I think what's so striking and beautiful about this, is that it so fits and lines up with what God invites us into. Um, I think this is the gospel, right, in our relationships, um, that he became vulnerable. He modeled that to us. He became as vulnerable as a baby. He drew near to us in the midst of our mess. He asks us to be vulnerable, to be on our knees before him. Um, and, you know, I know for me, the times that I have been most vulnerable in my life, whether it's just in moments that have felt really difficult or, um, you know, things that I felt really challenged in, the, the times that I've been most vulnerable and that have felt most risky almost, God has met me there in ways more than I could have ever imagined. And so I just want to end by saying, you know, I think God asks us to do these things in one way or another, to lean into our own discomfort, to trust that he will meet us there, um, to push through our own pride and self-sufficiency, this need to try and prove our worth or our value. Um, he asks us to believe that he's made us worthy, that our worthiness rests in him alone, and that we get to then in that way respond to that love and love him and love each other from this place of worthiness, and we get to parent from that place and be in our relationships from that place. And, um, you know, we, we don't need to hold on to shame. We don't need to ruminate about our inadequacies or insecurities or the things that we feel really short in. We don't need to ruminate about that because he says, regardless, right, regardless, I'm going to enter in with you and I love you. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I always like to think about it that it's not, it's not our job to defend or protect ourselves, even though we we have this sort of natural tendency to want to do that. But it's, it's his job, and he's done it already, right? It's his work, and he has saved us already. And um, we don't have to save ourselves. So I just, to me, it's such a joy to get to share some of this information, but also to just see it, it fits. It fits in. Um, and we get to sort of take these steps trusting that God's going to be with us in the midst of that. That is all that I have. There are some verses there on the on the page that I think just apply to this, and I've been encouraged by. And um, you know, I'll read I'll read the first one. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self discipline. And just that we get to be emboldened in this truth. 
That's it. That's all I have. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. So you're welcome. we have just about um, 15 minutes or so to have some take a discussion. Oh, yeah. Do you guys have questions? Yeah. Please. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. It's like right where I'm living. Awesome. I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm watching my five-year-old like struggle yeah. with some of. Like, now I'm like, oh, my language for this. Is good. Yeah. How do you help children kind of think through this and talk about this? Absolutely. What language do you use with them? That's a great question. Um, and it's hard. I will say it's hard. And I think it's ever evolving, right? Because it's like once we figure out the thing with the one stage, then we're on to the next stage before we know it. So I'm always trying to ask that same question. Um, I think for me, what I try to do is model it. I mean, part, a huge part of this is that we're modeling it, right? And so there are things that I will do. And, and then I am so, I have this moment of like, I can't believe I just did that, right? Like here's a really, this is a silly, silly, silly example. But my four-year-old was like digging in our trash, in our kitchen trash. I don't even know why. He was looking for something that he had thrown in there. And I got really like, oh my goodness, stop, don't do that. Because I knew there was like a raw chicken package in the bottom. Like the normal risk, whatever, I don't want my kid digging through. But I just had this really strong, for whatever reason, it was like my control thing. And it had this really strong reaction in that moment. And I overreacted, I totally overreacted to him. And then what I did is I came back and I said, I am so sorry, mommy is so silly, I totally overreacted to that. So what I did was I modeled to him this grace that I had for myself. And I don't do this all the time. Like this is a difficult thing to do. But I think those moments when we get to model that we're having self-compassion helps them see that and learn that that's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. The other thing is we just say all the time in our house, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. That's okay. No, bi no biggie, right? Like just the, the way that we can model that grace um, is really helpful. Because they do. They're like sponges and they absorb the stress and the shame that we feel. They really do. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Can you just speak a little bit to um, the concern that some people might have that, you know, if we sort of embrace this, that we're going to put our heart out there in the world and then really get hurt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I kind of touched on it in talking about that relationship between trust and vulnerability. And I think there is, there can be sort of this misconception that, okay, if I'm going to embrace vulnerability, I'm just going to pour out my soul in front of everybody, you know. And, and there, there's an absolute need for discernment, absolutely. Um, we need to feel safe in relationships, and there are some things that can happen in relationships that cause us to feel unsafe. So I am by no means dismissing that. Um, I think what we, need, what, what we get to do is sort of take that little step, like I said, that we, you take a step. If it's someone that's new and you don't know them, you get to sort of say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what happens when I give you this little, this little part of me, this little vulnerable part, and I'm going to see how you respond. And frankly, maybe there are going to be those times where it doesn't then feel safe after that experience, and I think that's okay, and that's discernment. And of course, there is room for forgiveness and you know process and all of that. Um, but I, I just want to say I think it's it's taking little steps. Actually, being like really vulnerable all of a sudden is is can be really difficult and hurtful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like some people, like I'm very open. Yeah. And uh, I think that it makes others feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So, like it's an, I'm always trying to manage the discomfort of others. Mm -hmm. And that seems like it's a control thing. So, or how do you? Like, yeah. Just, like, like I'm okay with it, but they're not. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, it's, it's, but it, but it, for me to act to be different and to like go backwards is to or to kind of retreat would be to be in you know, all myself. Totally. So. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, you know, I have a couple thoughts. I mean, I think on one hand, <clears throat> I think that we can certainly fall into that kind of caretaking role where I'm now sort of overly feeling responsible for what the other person's experiencing. And that is an issue or, or just a matter of, of boundaries in relationship and how to have a boundary where, you know, this is that person's experience and I understand that it might be difficult or challenging, but I'm not responsible for that. So there, I mean, you could 
perhaps think about that, or all of us together could think about that. You know, what what kind of boundaries do we have in our relationships? Do we sometimes feel overly responsible for someone else's feelings? Um, also, on the other hand, there's sort of the need for sensitivity and awareness of how do our words impact somebody else. It sounds like you're really aware of that. And I just think, you know, I think one of the things that I like to talk about in, in the work that I do is we can communicate, and sometimes we communicate in ways that aren't always effective in, in creating relationship. And so it's helpful to sometimes think about, am I saying something in a way that perhaps you know, I could say it in a different way that might be more easily accessible for somebody. And, you know, I, I mean, I certainly have to do that and figure out, you know what, I kind of came across or that was way too intense in that moment. You know, how do, I, how do I say this in a way where this person can really engage with me? So I just think it's, you know, sort of asking those questions and finding out what's going on, but that's a great question. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything? Thank you, oh, you're welcome. So great to be here. Um, just to add to, on the bottom of the page is my name and email and phone number. So I am so happy to talk with any of you guys about any more of this or if you have any questions or want to follow up with me about anything, you can contact me. Thank you. Thank you.